Welcome to this online service at City of Hope. Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in the synagogue, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Have we been preaching the gospel of the kingdom this year? I think so. And he was healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease among the people. And so Jesus starts his ministry. He proclaims the gospel. He says, my kingdom has arrived. My government has arrived on earth. There's a new dispensation. And then it goes to the next verse, which is not in chapter 4, but it's the first verse of Matthew 5. Remember, when the Bible was originally written, it wasn't written in chapters like we have it today. That was only added later, the numbers and so on. So it was just one story. And so the very next verse says, Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. And Jesus gives them in that moment, he gives them what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. It's been claimed the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and seven, I remember at Bible school, we memorized various portions of scriptures. And one of the key portions that we memorized was the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And it changed our lives. And so what Jesus is really doing, he's proclaiming and he's saying, heaven's kingdom has arrived. He says, heaven's government has now come. And now what he's doing, he's going to give us the manifesto of heaven's kingdom. Every political party has a manifesto. It's, it's what they would do when they're in charge, how they would govern, what the laws would be if they are in charge. And Jesus comes down. He says, my kingdom is here, and here follows the manifesto of my kingdom. And he gives us three chapters, 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, of the manifesto of heaven, powerful portion of Scripture. If you want to know how to live in God's kingdom, if you want to live, know how to live in God's world successfully, then we need to better study the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But what he does for us as men, Reggie, I don't know about you, but most of us as men, we don't like complicated, we like simple. If you give me 101 rules, I'm probably not going to do it. But if you give me 5, 3, or 7, if you can simplify it for me as a man, I would think I can do it. Then where is it, Varney? Like, where's money? You keep it simple to us, we can do it, okay? And so Jesus, instead of just giving us the full manifesto, he opens his sermon on the mountain, and he only gives us seven points. He gives us the Beatitudes. Have you heard of the Beatitudes? He, gives us the, he says, this is my executive summary of my manifesto. He says, if you can do these things, you will be blessed in my universe. If you, if, you, if you can fashion your lives around these seven principles, you will be blessed in my world. In fact, the word blessed there in Greek also means to be happy, to be fortunate, to be spiritually prosperous, and also to expand yourself. I find it very interesting that the first words God spoke to Adam and Eve when he made them in Genesis, when he created man, and it says, it says God created man and woman after his own image and likeness, and God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, occupy, go. And what's the first thing God does to man? He blesses them. Why? God doesn't want us to live a single day, a single minute, a single second on this world, in this earth, without his blessing. First thing God does in the Old Testament is blesses man. The last thing he says in the Old Testament, in Malachi chapter 4, he says, I'm going to turn hearts of fathers to sons and sons to fathers so that I can remove a curse from the land. God is saying, I blessed you in Genesis 1. You messed it up. It brought a curse. But my promise, my prophetic promise is I'm going to remove the curse and replace it with a new blessing. And then Jesus opens his ministry in Matthew 4 and chapter 5 verse 1. He says, I want to teach you how to live a blessed life in my Father's kingdom. Old Testament, New Testament, God say, I want my children to be blessed. Come on. You should ought to be much more excited about being blessed than that. God is saying, I, I want my children to, to be happy. You know, there's a song that says, if you want to be happy for the rest of your life, get an ugly girl to marry you. There's a, a different way of getting happy. You don't have to marry an ugly girl to be married. All you have to do is follow these seven steps that the king gives us. Seven steps to happiness. But Jesus starts off and he says this, chapter, verse 3, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the government 
of heaven. What is poor in spirit? When Jesus didn't say, blessed are the poor. He said the poor in spirit. You see, the poor in spirit doesn't speak to my affluence, but to my attitude. It's not about how much or little money I have. It's about how much of a hold money has on me. That's being poor in spirit. Being poor in spirit means to reckon myself poor to this world and reckon myself rich towards God. Reckon myself poor to the things of this world, money and things, so I can reckon myself being rich towards God. Being poor in spirit is saying, God, all the things and the money that I've acquired in this world does not fill the hole in my soul. Nothing that I can buy and consume and get and grab can fill the void inside, but you, only you can do it. That's being poor in spirit. God, I need you more than the fancy cars. God, I need you more than the lavish lifestyle. God, I need you more you alone can fill the hole in my soul. That's the poor in spirit. Poor there means in the Greek language to be a helpless beggar. To, he says to, to take the posture. doesn't mean you are a helpless beggar, but take the posture of a helpless beggar who lacks the resources to meet his own needs. You see, all the problems started back in the garden when Adam and Eve chose to fill themselves with more of self chose to fill themselves with more of the flesh, chose to fill themselves with the ability to judge for themselves what is good. All our problems started right there at the tree of knowledge. But the solution to all of that problems is to say, God, I empty myself of all of this so that you can fill me with all of heaven. See, a heart possessed by possessions cannot be possessed by God. God says, empty yourself. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because to them belong the government of God. To them belong the kingdom of God. I need to recognize my poverty without God. Doesn't matter how much or how little I have, Lord, I'm poor without you. It's been said that some people are so poor that all they have is money. Some people are so poor all they have is money. So step number one, if we want to be happy, if we want to be blessed in our Father's kingdom, is to reckon ourselves poor to this world and, and rich unto God. Step number two is verse four. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now there's two matters that we're mourning. One is we mourn loss. We just heard the testimony of, of grief share. And when you suffer a loss like that, you, loss, you lose a loved one or you lose something close to you or someone close to you. There is a loss that we need to mourn. And God gives us the promise that if you mourn it, you will be comforted. God can only comfort the losses that I acknowledge and that I mourn. And I love this church because of the cross-culture nature of our church. We can learn a lot from one another. And sometimes one group of people have a certain strength that others can learn from and vice versa. And, and something that, that those of us who come, who hail more maybe from a Western background, we don't do loss well. We don't do mourning well. I mean, I'm not talking about being a morning person or an evening person. I'm talking about mourning a loss, right? And so... You know, most, most, if I can call it white people, most white people, if I need to do their funeral, then they ask me, Pastor, can you do it in 40 minutes and get it over and done with? But our African brothers and sisters, they start Monday night with a prayer meeting at the house of the family of dece deceased, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, and then Saturday we've got the big funeral, right? Why? They know what it means to mourn a loss. They say when somebody passes in our family, everything stops. And we're going to take our time mourning this loss. Because God says, if you mourn, I will comfort it. The problem, if we don't mourn something adequately, five years down the line, two years down the line, ten years down the line, we find our soul is actually still mourning that loss. But now we're battling depression, we're battling anxiety, we're battling all of these emotional conditions. It all stems from the place where we didn't mourn a loss properly. The other thing that happens if I don't find God's comfort for that which I mourn, I'm going to look 
for a false comfort. I'm going to find a counterfeit affection to try and comfort me. And that false comfort can come in the form of a, a drug addiction or an alcohol addiction or a television addiction or a sport addiction or a pornography addiction or a whatever other addiction we, we can think of, an eating addiction. We will find something else to comfort us, give us temporary comfort. God says, if you mourn it, I will comfort it. Bless it are those who mourn. Blessed are those who acknowledge the loss that they are suffering and bring that loss to me and say, God of all comfort, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, the better comforter, you would comfort me. And so that's the one way we mourn. The second way we mourn is to mourn our own sin. Scripture talks about godly sorrow that leads to repentance. You know, how many of you have got children that when they say they're sorry, they only say sorry to get out of trouble. I dare not ask how many of you have got spouses that only say they're sorry to get out of trouble, okay? Because that can also be a reality. I heard this funny thing this week. Don't be mad at me, but it's quite funny. They say, when a man realized he was wrong, what does he do? He apologizes, right? When a man realizes he's wrong, he apologizes. When his wife realizes she is wrong, she will argue until he realizes that he is wrong. <laughs> Listen, I know that's a gross, that is a gross generalization, but I thought it was quite funny, right? I thought it was quite funny. I don't want to be in trouble with all the wives afterwards. It's just a joke. Godly sorrow that leads to... We all have those children at times when they, they, they say, yeah, sorry, yammer. Or they just say sorry to get out of trouble. That's not what God is talking about here. Godly sorrow, ha having mourning, bro, I, I, must have, I must mourn the fact that I hurt the heart of God, that I misrepresented my father's heart. God says if you mourn like that over the sins of others and over your own sins... God says you will be comforted. And the word comfort, the word parakaleo in Greek means Holy Spirit. He says if you will mourn your losses, but also mourn your sins, you will attract the presence of the parakaleo, the Holy Spirit. He's the one that walks close beside you, your advocate. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who reckon themselves poor to this world, but rich to God. Number three, verse five, it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Can you say, Blessed are the meek? Now, the meek doesn't mean weak. Come on, can you say that? Meek doesn't mean weak. But meek means strength under restraint. In ancient days, they spoke of mighty kings or mighty emperors as being meek and mighty. They also used the term as being lions and lambs. The great Alexander, or Alexander the Great, was, was a king or emperor like that. They called him meek and mighty. They would know how to be meek among trusted friends. How to be, the Afrikaans word is sagmoedig. Okay, sagmoedig. But Sachmurah klinks a little bit like a softie, right? Ons is sagmoedig, maar ons moet ook waagmoedig wees. We need to be meek, but we also need to be mighty. So Alexander the Great would, for instance, know how to be meek amongst trusted friends, his close inner circle, so that he can be mighty in the presence of his enemy. A great biblical example of a king that was called meek and mighty, was King David. And if you read the Psalms, you find that oftentimes he would make himself meek in the presence of God. He would say, God, my sins are before me the whole day. I pray that you would cleanse my heart, oh God. Give me a new heart inside of me. I'm so aware of my human weaknesses. My, all my closest friends and companions have become enemies to God. They've all abandoned me. And he's weak, and not weak, but meek in, in the presence of God. 
And that makes him strong and mighty in the presence of his enemies. What happens when we are not meek in the presence of God and mighty in the presence of our enemies? I find this, when I'm not meek in God's presence, and that's where I get my strength, that when I come to my work, when I come to my business, when I come to the government department where I work or the school that I work, where I really need to fight some battles, where there's some injustices, where I sometimes need to make a stand or take a stand and say, this is what's right, I fall, I, 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 I fold in being mighty and I become meek when I need to be mighty. And what happens when I'm meek here in the battlefront when I need to be mighty? When I'm not mighty here, I'm so frustrated within me that I go home and I take out my might on my loved ones. I take out my might on my children and my spouse. And God is saying, no, you need to learn how to be meek in the right place and how to be mighty in the right place. How to be meek at the right time and how to be mighty in the right time. How to be a lamb, a gentle lamb in my presence so you can be a mighty, ferocious lion in the presence of your enemies. Blessed, happy are the meek. Because they will inherit the earth. The first one, the poor, blessed are the poor in spirit, it said they will inherit the heaven or the kingdom of heaven. So when we're poor in spirit, when we recognize our, our riches is not of this world, God gives us heaven. But when we learn the art of meekness, God gives us the earth. God says you can govern on earth now. If you can learn the power of meekness and to know when to be meek and when to be mighty, then you can begin to govern on earth. And, and the word earth there means land and property. How many of you want property? Come on. Ag, I want more property. We want more property for the church. We want to expand. We're going to extend the kingdom of God. God says, you want property? You want land? Learn meekness. You want access to heaven? Become poor in spirit. Learn to mourn. When you want access to govern on earth, learn meekness. We're going to become meek and mighty, amen? I'm just going to introduce the fourth step, and I'm going to talk about it more next Sunday, and then we're going to do communion. But verse 5 said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. I'm going to talk next Sunday on the number one key to happiness. The number one key to happiness is to develop a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Church, we live in a time where the Bible has prophesied at the end times they will call that which is wrong right and that which is right wrong. They will put laws in place that prohibits us to call something wrong wrong. But what is this righteousness? And I don't have time to go into the detail of that. Just two parts of righteousness. I've, I've spoken on it before as well. There's right standing and there's right living. Who puts us in right standing? Can we earn our way into right standing with God? No. No amount of good works can make us right with God. Only the work of Jesus. Only faith in the work of Jesus. So it's the work of Jesus that places you and I in right standing with God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's the work of Jesus. But it's your and my acts of righteousness that puts us in right standing with other people and keeps us in right standing with other people. And so we need to seek righteousness. We need to seek to be in right standing with God. And I think we need to seek that every day. Yes, we give our lives to Jesus once off and we're saved. But you know what? I, I find that in my own mind, I need to clothe myself every day and say, God, thank you. I clothe myself with the breastplate of righteousness. I, I clothe myself with the, with the truth that I stand right before you without any earning or de uh, deserving on my side, without any works on my own. I stand right just because of the work of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. I clothe myself. Thank you, Jesus, that you clothe me with robes of righteousness. 
Daily I need to clothe myself in my own mind to remind myself I don't have to perform into God's good books. Listen, I want to ask you a question. Do I become righteous by doing right things? Or do I do right things because I am righteous? Because Jesus had done the work that is finished. Because I am right before God. All I want to do is do right by other people. To represent my loving Father well to them. To show the world that He's righteous. God is saying this morning, the world is trying to fill us with a hunger and a thirst for the things of this world. The world is one to saturate us so much that we have no more place in us to hunger for Him. The world wants to occupy our mind space, our time, our passions, our desires so much that we come to God and He's got nothing to fill. He's got nothing to work with. God is saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who empty themselves of themselves. God is not necessarily saying sell everything you have. He said that to one rich young man. The principle we're learning there is don't be owned by your possessions. Reckon yourself poor to these things. Pour it out. Say, God, the cars I have, the houses I have, the property, the businesses I have means nothing if I don't have you, Lord. I'm poor if all I have is money, Lord. I'm poor if all I have is things. I want to empty myself. Lord, I want to mourn the losses that I've suffered. I also want to mourn the sins that I've committed that misrepresented your righteousness to other people. I need to learn the art, Lord, of being meek and mighty. Meek at the right time and mighty at the right time. And Lord, I want to cultivate a hunger and a thirst for your righteousness. I want to awaken an appetite in my heart for you and for, for doing the things that are right in your eyes. I want to, I want to create a greater appetite. My hunger, my hunger for, for God and His kingdom and, and His righteousness must be bigger for my desires for sin and my desires for things and my desires for money and my desires for the, for the world. Give me a greater hunger in my heart. Give me a thirst, Lord, like never before. Because blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And the promise is they will be satisfied. I want to tell you that the things of this world cannot satisfy. Having a lot of money helps because it makes our lives a little bit more comfortable on earth, right? But it cannot satisfy. 